Uh, the next talk coming up, um, and the last one for tea, is um, O'Crumbs responding to a biscuit beetle infestation within the Economic Botany Collection at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew um, with Gayathri and Erin. Um, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm I'm Erin, I'm the Collection Manager for the Economic Botany Collection. Hi, I'm Guy Three. I'm the Collections and Database Officer. So, um, in January 2023, the Economic Botany Collection at Kew faced an infestation of Stegobium panaceum, aka the biscuit beetle, and this impacted around 14,000 objects, posing a risk to the entire collection. Um, so, today we'll talk a bit about the collection. We'll discuss our responses to this pest outbreak, um, including the skills, facilities, resources, and importantly, the people involved um, for an emergency response. And we're also talking about trials and triumphs. So uh, you'll hear about several challenges we faced as well as how um, some of the outcomes were positive as a result of that. Um, and towards the end, we'll share some learning and tips as well. So if any of you haven't been before, here's a brief introduction. Um, the gardens at Kew were established to understand and protect plants and fungi for the well-being of people and future life on Earth. And um, of course, it's known for its glass houses, gardens, and several collections, including the herbarium, which houses over 7 million specimens. Um, but it is less well known for its Museum of Economic Botany. Um, or Economic Botany Collection, as it's known today. Um, this was founded in 1847, two years after the gardens opened to the public, um, and we'll probably refer to it as the EBC. And it was established by William Jackson Hooker, who was a director. Um, the purpose centered around Britain's role in trade in empire. So it consists of biological and cultural material, over 100,000 objects, and this includes archeological, botanical, ethnographic and scientific material um, spanning 6,000 years ago, all the way from 6,000 years ago to the present. Um, and it's still growing, providing insights into human uses of plants and fungi. And while we don't have a permanent display space at the moment, um, the collections access really frequently. So we have many researchers, PhD students, source communities, artists, scientists, etc. So what uh, we're going to try and talk about is what happens when our very small team uh, is impacted by a pesky pest situation. So we'll share some of our learnings and what we also wish we'd known in hindsight. Um, we also just want to point out that um, we're talking about our experiences generalists. We're not, uh, ent can't say the word, <laughs> entomologists. Um, we handle things like collections, care, hosting, visitors, um, documentation, res registrar responsibilities, but we also have to acknowledge that we're constantly learning new things about the collection. Um, and in this case, against our will. Um, so you'll probably have uh, got the sense that a big proportion of the collection is at risk by this particular pest. So I'm just going to talk about Okay, so what was the problem? Sigomium panaceum, or more commonly known as biscuit beetles. A lot of you are probably already familiar with them. Um, they're a common sight across the world in houses, stores, warehouses, and kitchens. Uh, they aren't fussy eaters. They'll pretty much eat any dried plant food. So as you can imagine, that was a nightmare for us. Um, their favorite foods obviously include biscuits, cereals, grains, flowers, and medicines. Um, they really like high temperatures and high humidity environments. So they can complete their life cycle in under six weeks at 30 degrees Celsius. And a humidity that's over 50% can significantly speed up their development. So you might want to look out for signs of infestation if you see anything like frass or um, which is their insect secretion or small ball holes. So as you can see, we're kind of a biscuit beetles dream. These are some of the images, some of the objects we have, which are quite carbohydrate, starch heavy, a lot of um, med med medicinal objects as well. Um, but this isn't the first time the EBC has had to manage the pest outbreak from these little critters. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So one of my predecessors, Naomi Rumble and David Pinninger, consultant entomologist, wrote a paper on the outbreak that happened in 1994. In 1998, a purpose-built building named the Joseph Banks Building, after a famous botanist, was rehoused from four museums and became the new Museum of Economic Botany. 
1994, the entire collection was then put into this building and the decision was made to freeze only the wood specimens and not the rest of the collection, which may have contributed to the large outbreak in 1994. To control the outbreak and limit the development of the life cycle, temperatures were lowered from 20 degrees to 17.5 degrees and to maintain a humidity of 50% and under. This was done for a year, but didn't significantly kill adult beetles or larvae, only prevented them from breeding and completing their life cycle. So after a year, the decision was made to further reduce the temperature to 13 degrees Celsius. It took about five years until there were no more sightings of live beetles. Various traps were laid down, including pheromone and sticky traps. Um, insecticide was sprayed in storage areas and infected objects were frozen for three days at minus 30 degrees Celsius. Today, we still have a large number of sticky traps, which are replaced every three to four months. Um, none of the none of these picked, were picked up any beetles during the current outbreak. Um, so instead, we use pheromone traps, light traps, and continue to freeze objects for the same amount of time, depending on the material. Gaia 3 is now going to give you an overview of the challenges from last year's outbreak. So um, I'm going to situate these in terms of who, what, where, and when. Uh, so who, in terms of people, uh, mainly it's me and Erin, so this means limited manpower to coordinate the response in terms of planning and execution. Um, there is, of course, also a smaller budget um, and less autonomy to allocate wider resources as well. So uh, going into this, we felt a sen sense of an ease because of the sensitive nature around a pest outbreak. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, but we work with other institutions, so external partners, stakeholders, and the we felt the sense of reputational risk, not just from the pest issue itself, but the surrounding access that was a knock-on effect. Um, we're also quite separated from the other collections at Kew, so this probably affected some of the internal communication. We had a lot of colleagues keeping on asking us about, you know, the risk around cross-contamination. Um, and while we also have a really amazing group of uh, volunteers, a lot of them were helping us remotely, so this wouldn't necessarily translate to the physical demands of manual labour, burying boxes, climbing ladders, and so on. Um, so next, uh, what? Um, so what factors were there around pest management? Well, for one, the extent of the infestation, we couldn't really establish what uh, was causing it, so that um, didn't help in terms of um, how we would go about curbing the problem. And uh, we also as Erin said, have an IPM routine, but it wasn't entirely perfect. For one, uh, the freezer used to be physically in the store, even though it was away from objects, we didn't have a proper dirty area. And um, we also had to consider the fact that the EBC has its own quirks being a biocultural collection. So uh, the wider staff at Q um, who did end up helping us, we had to really invest time, avoid any shortcuts in terms of explaining object handling, um, especially for external teams to ours. Um, next, in terms of location, some of the issues we had uh, with the facilities and its limitations. So the Joseph Banks building, as Erin mentioned, was um, it's, it was initially designed to have an idyllic rooftop garden. Um, unfortunately, that's a haven for pests. So we actually have a skylight in our office where we host visits, and that was one of the entry points. Um, we don't have a canteen space either and our freezer facilities for large objects. Whilst on site, we have to go to another building. So all of these factors highlighted the need for a quarantine space. Um, and in terms of what well, one of the other factors was the fact that we share our building with teams like the events team and online shops. So there's the foot traffic. And in terms of turnover space for the decant, we had um, we borrowed a sec small section of an events hall, but um, that was contingent on us, on us um, getting out of there by the time the summer music festival is coming out for this store equipment. And that leads on to more time constraints. Um, so clearly we couldn't wait to do, you know, list risk not doing intervening in some way. Um, with summer around the corner, temperatures increasing, could uh, there's a risk of uh, reproduction of the beetle. And we also had tight budget, so the logistics, um, particularly as we wouldn't have the overflow space on the return of the bulk freeze, we had to basically fit everything back into the collection. So optimistically, we hoped that we could stagger that having two batches return uh, with two weeks as an interval. It actually took six. Um, but Aaron's gonna say a bit more. 
So now I'm going to map out what we actually did. Um, at the very early stages, we did what we called a panic pack of 90 variant boxes when we thought the extent was much smaller than it actually was. Um, because of this experience, we began to rethink the situation, assess factors such as what kind of storage do we need, who should we involve, and how we should proceed. So this meant we obviously had to make a plan. Um, I just want to start off by saying that we just don't do what we did and, and pa panic. <laughs> um, it's really important to not panic. I think the taboo around the topic didn't help us. Um, so speaking to calm people with experience is really helpful. Um, we then sought advice from our in-house team and consulted senior management as they would be the ones signing off on the resources and budgets. Afterwards, we sought advice and quotes from different types of solutions from external consultants, and such as integrated contamination management and Harwell through Q's insurance. Um, and we settled on off-site off -site freezing solution with Harwell, we got approval for those budgets uh, and commenced with the logistics. So we planned the workflow by liaising with internal teams, reviewing operational impacts and with EBC and other departments and began communicating with wider colleagues about volunteering. We then identified priority objects and areas, determined what to freeze and what capacity, and then began the workflow for the pack up. Obviously, we had to do all the risk assessments as well. Um, and just to note, this wasn't a linear process. Conversations were often going backwards and forwards and things were happening at the same time. So um, to begin implementation, um, we often involved trial runs, estimates of equipment, volumes, working out bag sizes, coin to bag containers. It also involved flagging materials, including glass, wax, and lacquer, which couldn't or didn't need freezing. We began selecting the aisles most infected to contain the spread, which is a total of about three aisles on both sides. Um, we do, currently don't use a numbering system, so we numbered the shelves simply by writing directly on them and noting on the box to speed up unpacking. Um, and once we collected all the empty herbarium boxes and trolleys, we then trained up the volunteers. We had around 50 volunteers, some of them more keen than others. Um, we realized it was worth recording a video. So I went over key instructions for handling and packing as they were requested. Um, and then although they were closely supervised, we think this video really helped to save repetition of the day and just to allow like a familiarity beforehand. So because of our limited capacity, this also meant that we could partially resume normal activities such as tours and visits, et cetera. Okay, so some of the implementation as well continued. When we were undertaking packing, we had to review if the objects could be frozen um, and fit into the bearing boxes. If they didn't, we took them to the on-site freezer in a different building. Mm -hmm. And then, the, then it became like a game of the best game of like Tetris, how you could fit the best spot boxes into the bearing boxes, um, which often meant safely packing them in, taking into account space, weight and fragility. Um, once it was full, the herbarium boxes were put into heavy duty herbarium polythene bags and tightly sealed with elastic bands. Then we would use cage trolleys, take the boxes down the corridor to the events hall and stacked five high within a cordoned off area as the space was still being used by other departments. The empty trolleys were taken back and the process repeated. So when we started running out of boxes, we had to um, borrow a lot of colleagues' muscles and vehicles to retrieve as many of our own boxes as possible. All 400 boxes were then loaded onto the vans. Um, we chose not to palletize at the time because of space restrictions, frozen off site and then stored in a clean unit for several weeks. The first half was returned and we left a gap for the second and final batch so that we could unpack as much as possible because of the space limitations. Um, all 100, 400 boxes were frozen and returned to us by the 20th of August last year. Eight months on and unfortunately our ambitions to unpack everything by this talk weren't quite realistic um, as the momentum began to slow down after Christmas and we've had other projects which have meant that some of the unpacking has taken a bit of a backseat. However, um... Some of those priorities were actually things that would help implement long-term outcomes that were a bit more positive. So uh, for one, now we have uh, lots of staff at Q who are trained in object handling. We also improved the cleaning rotors and the housekeeping generally around the collections. Um, Erin and I did some emergency planning training, which was really helpful. And um, we're also uh, shifting onto a new collections management system. So we're improving things like recording pest damage and emergency planning within that as well. Um, so you can see the before and after picture. It used to be a storeroom, which uh, we didn't like going into at all. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and lastly, we just want to, uh, we felt it was important to thank volunteers. So we hosted a cyanotype workshop just a bit before Christmas. So um, that was just to say, you know, we couldn't have done any of this without them. And despite the stress levels, we just, uh, this was actually a good opportunity to get to know other teams across um, where we can be quite siloed and, you know, some people have worked at Q for decades. So 
amongst doing these repetitive activities, we could actually speak to people and hear about what they got up to, everyone from new starters to um, retired colleagues as well. Um, so what went wrong? Uh, we've already talked about some of the challenges. So, you know, the, the 90 boxes that Erin mentioned without the shelf numbers. Um, we went into this feeling quite unprepared because of, as we've talked about reputational risks and not having dealt with something at this sort of scale. Um, and also, as we've mentioned before, we couldn't really find out what was actually the origin to help with mitigation. Um, and in terms of um, one of the problems was that we frequently ran out of supplies, so the Ziploc bags, and that resulted in out-of-pocket costs, actually mainly by Erin. Um, so that wasn't great, but it was reimbursed. Um, the decamp space that we talked about was unsupervised. Um, there was actually a situation where, um, that because the clients used the space, um, people had basically left coats on top of the collection, which wasn't ideal. <laughs> so we had, to, we had to watch out for things like that. And then um, lastly, one of the worst, most stressful situations was um, one of my colleagues can attest to, uh, a lot of boxes were delivered upside down by um, the company. Um, by some sort of miracle um, that didn't actually affect a noticeable damage. We haven't noticed anything on unpacking, but that was something that was the first batch. So the second batch, we made them pay attention and uh, it didn't end up being a problem. Um, just so we, we've got we got the sad wrap up face now. So we're just going to skip past the top tips, but here's some. Um, but we really just want to conclude and say a, a massive thank you to everyone who volunteered their time, vehicles, resources, and advice. It was a massive team effort, and we really couldn't have done it without everyone. Um, the implementation was mostly successful. We had minimal damage to the collection, and I just want to encourage everyone to kind of break the taboo around pest outbreaks mm -hmm. because we all commonly face it. So, thank you very much for listening. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? We've got time for a couple of questions before tea. Uh, Claire. So you said that you didn't have any legal problems when you served the country 13 to yourself. Um, was it still at 13 that they were dying up? No, so they kept it at the... Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so I was asked about if the temperature had remained at 13 degrees when we found the current outbreak. Um, no, so they kept it at about 13 degrees for I think it was about five years. Um, but because it's a workable space, because we don't have any separate teaching space or um, it, you just can't work in there for any period of time so they started to put it back up um and it was kind of agreed with con consultations that it was okay to raise it a little bit so it currently works at a bit of a higher temperature at the moment um but yeah we're thinking of going back down again uh, we're, we're just having a battle with the states um yeah about <laughs> getting it back down about to about 15 degrees again um tv um what was your question uh, the stuff, but not even from other departments. Mm. Yes, yeah, the new quarantine, sorry, uh, yeah, um, so asked about changing the routine um, for decom decontamination, even if we get material from other departments. Um, so, yeah, the new quarantine room, obviously now we've moved our freezer and it's in there, which has made a massive difference, so it's already changed our workflow, so obviously we don't go into the collection now, um, we don't take anything dirty into the collection, so that's already changed. Um, it also changed the way, I guess, we loan to other collections as well, even things like the libraries um, will freeze any incoming and outgoing material. Um, so it's definitely changed. The quarantine room has been a bit of a lifesaver for us now. Uh, I think we've got time for one more. Oh, Amy. Um, Lindsay from the Manifesto Museum asks, are you still regularly freezing the collection? And if so, for how long and at what point? Um, so the question was, are we still regularly freezing? If so, how and at what temperature? Yes, again, any incoming or outgoing material, we freeze. Um, it's a bit of a tricky one because we have visitors on a, a daily basis and we kind of agree that we can't keep, we have at least one visitor in every day. So it depends on the length of time that material is out. If we're loaning, obviously, if we have analysis or any other type of research, then we will always freeze. But it really depends on how long the material is out for and for what purpose. 
um, um, freeze the temperature isn't as low either. Yeah, so we wanted a bigger freezer, but what we didn't realize that the bigger the freezer you get, they can't get low enough. Um, the temperatures can't get low enough. So we tended to, our previous freezer was minus 40 degrees and we would freeze for a couple of days, a bit like our collection management unit. Um, but the current freezer is a huge, almost looks like an American style fridge, um, which is much bigger, but actually not as convenient. Um, and it only freezes at minus 20. So we have to freeze it for much longer two weeks we save 10 10 days two weeks mm -hmm. okay right uh thank you so much okay. thank you. Thank you.